discuss the metapsychology of Vedanta. Hmm? Why am I calling Vedanta metapsychology? Because Vedanta is the primary discipline and it is a psychology which includes all other subjects. For example, generally people would consider science to be a primary discipline or philosophy to be a primary discipline. But the activity of doing science or doing philosophy is an activity of the mind, actually. So the discipline that uh, envelops, that uh, includes all other disciplines is actually psychology or the meta-psychology. Uh, it's all aspects of in, uh, human endeavor, human awareness, human inquiry are actually psychological in nature. So Vedanta deals with consciousness, the various levels of consciousness and how to come to our ultimate potential, to the highest level of consciousness, of enlightenment, self-realization, and God-realization. So, one may ask, well, is this a religious thing, is this a dogmatic thing, or is it scientific? So, as far as science goes, the scientific methodology means uh, having observation, making hypothesis, and then demonstrating that your hypothesis is correct. And not only that you demonstrated it once, and no one could ever produce the same result again, but it should be testable, it should be repeatable by others in other places, wherever they are, under the same conditions. So, in the same way, Vedanta is like this. It gives the hypothesis and the experimental practice that you can do in your life, and the result is, can be uh, predicted, it gives predictions and uh, it gives, so you can demonstrate it and if someone else will also practice uh, the conclusions of Vedanta, which is Bhakti Yoga, Bhakti is the conclusion of Vedanta, they can also test and, and by repeating the experiment, they'll also have a, a result also, similar result. Uh, proving the hypothesis of Vedanta. So Vedanta really is the fullest application of the scientific methodology to the, the field of consciousness. Mm. So uh, don't think that we're discussing something here which is in any way irrational. Completely rational but also has the potential to go beyond the limitations of the ordinary human perception and ordinary human rationality. Mm. So, let's move along. If you want to understand Vedanta, there are three subjects. And by understanding these three subjects, you will be able to make sense of everything. In your own life, in the lives of others. In fact, if you can just take, if you can just assimilate these three tools of interpretation, you will actually under, understand all the defects and also the good points of any philosophy or any idea uh, that you come by because you'll be able to measure them to what degree they're successful by understanding these three uh, components. By these three components, you actually be able to even measure the, if you like, the diameter of your own imagination and that of others as well, to see exactly what is the stage of development of yourself and the stage of development of others. So we want to share extremely powerful interpretive tools here. Um, so the first one we want to discuss, and we, it's, this is meta, remember, so it's very, very broad, it's very, very big. There will, there will be nothing which is not encompassed by what we want to discuss, Vedanta. The first subject is context. Why is this important? We've all had experience in our life 
we meet with people who have completely different opinions. They're also intelligent to a degree. They're also rational to a degree. We're also intelligent and rational to a degree. But how is it that so many intelligent and rational people have a completely different understanding or interpretation of life? And uh, though we're all seeing the same things before our eyes, the trees are green, the sky is blue, gravity comes down and fire goes up, uh, we, we, we're all seeing the same world essentially, but still everyone has different ideas and they just can't seem to agree mm. on things. Mm. Uh, so how is that? So we want to go deeply into the subject of meaning. When people are discussing about the meaning of this or the meaning of life, but they, they have to look first at the preliminary foundation of that discussion. What is the meaning of meaning? What's the mean? Do you even think? Did you consider it? What's the meaning of meaning first? Because any philosopher or any ordinary person is speaking with another one, another person, and they're counting on the fact that the other person will understand what I mean. And I'll understand what they mean. And we're communicating, we're exchanging ideas, and we're searching for the truth together. So meaning is extremely important. But what is it? So we're going to discuss these three things, context, causation, and consciousness these foundational components of Vedanta, but first we'll begin with the discussion of context. Meaning is the relationship between a particular content and the context that it's in. Hmm? Just like, if you, it, it, let's just take as a, as, as a paradigm a word. A word has meaning, like the word good. Right? So if the person who <coughs> loves you very much says to you, good, bye. <laughs> is that good? <laughs> you see, the word, the word has its own content, but depending on the context, the meaning and the, all the implications will change. And everything is, uh, in life is like that. Um, for example, let's say that you believe that uh, we are spiritual beings with the soul. But the soul came into existence the day you were conceived. Right? So you don't believe in any life before this life. Hmm? Then you're going to wonder, well, why are, there so, why are people suffering in the Why do good, good people suffer? It becomes an intractable problem. It's called, in philosophy, it's called theodicy. Answering the question, if God is good, why do bad things happen to good people? Hmm? So if, you, if you're working... Uh, the, with a life and the context of life you're thinking of is it all started when I was conceived then the things that are happening to you have become inexplicable or uh, the cosmos seems unfair or there's no God or if there is a God he's not fair or whatever but if someone is working within a context that actually the soul is eternal and has no beginning and I existed before then it's easily explained why so-called bad things happen to good people because this is the unfoldment of karma from previous life. So at the moment I'm not presenting any idea to be right or wrong, I'm just illustrating the fact that the way we interpret what's happening now depends on the context, the bigger context that we either consciously or subconsciously superimpose around the content of whatever we're discussing. So uh, we can divide the content and context in a very practical way, and that is um, our perceptions are made meaningful by the context of our conceptions. You see? In other words, all of us, we all have five senses, and so we're all seeing, touching, tasting, smelling, and hearing the world, and more or less we experience it in the same way. Yet still, everyone has different opinions. Why? Because the, way, the meaning that we give to the world is different depending on the context of the conceptions that we have of what this world really is. Hmm? Mm -hmm. For example, um, if someone thinks that everything is just made of matter, 
Mm. Everything is just made of matter. Then it doesn't matter whether you are, you cheat. If you want to win in some activity, whether it's business or sport or anything, it doesn't matter if you cheat. What matters is that you win. It's just the result that matters. Uh, because there's, there is no meaning other than uh, the success is the fulfillment of the base instincts of the body and our desires. You see? Whereas if someone has a conception that outside of our perception there's a, a God or, or even, for example, Buddhists don't believe in God, but they do believe that there's a type of cosmic karma. And then cheating in any endeavor would be completely you know, off the menu because it would result in a future uh, experience of suffering. So it would be counterproductive for oneself to cheat because the result w would be that in the future you will be cheated and so on, like that. So would all of our perceptions are more or less the same, but the, the way that we interpret the world depends on our conception in most cases, in many cases, of not our conception of just what we can see but what lies behind uh, our perceptual horizon. So this is very important thing to consider. We have two types of horizons. We have a perceptual horizon. You imagine, let's say, you're in the middle of a field somewhere and you look in all directions and you can see, and there's a circle around you, you can only see so far in all directions. But there's one thing that you know, and that is that the landscape does not end where your perceptual horizon ends. It continues. Right? So, and that's not only in terms of the size of things, but also in terms of the, the structures of things, the minuteness as well. We can only see things which are so small. We can only hear sounds which are within a particular frequency. We can only see light between infrared and ultraviolet. So all of our senses have this uh, perimeter, and that is our perceptual horizon. And then we interpret everything that we're experiencing in terms of our conceptual horizon. Hmm? We have a conceptual horizon as well. For example, you might not be able to see um, the government or the IRS or anything. Uh, you can't see them right now, but you will have to give a certain amount of your money that you earn to them. <laughs> right? According, so you have an idea that the, the fruit of what I'm doing, I may have to give away to someone for some reason, and, and someone may like it, someone may not like it, but there are things that we can't see, and, and, and we are thinking, well, I've got to part with this hard-earned money because whatever, the IRS, the, the tax department want to take it from me, like that. But is that really the cause? Is that the reason why you're losing your wealth? Actually. Huh? So if someone believes in karma, then you're only going to get so much fruit of your work. And whether it's the IRS or whether it's a thief, or whether it's whatever, one of your family members maxing out your credit card, or whatever it is, you're going to lose that. Hmm? And, and is is that karma? So we can, we can point the finger at this person or that person, but what does that mean? When we point to something as being the cause of something happening, it means this, and this is something we should consider. We've, we've just spoken a little bit about, remember we have three ideas, context, causation, and consciousness. So we've spoken a little bit about the um, importance of context and meaning in terms of how we interpret things. Now let's add another component to that, causation, and then we'll put the two together and something very startling will appear. Causation. When we say you are the cause of something, or this thing is the cause of something, when we uh, consider causation, that's the basis of all of our rational thinking. We always think in terms of cause because it's our experience that we see regularities in nature around us. And we see that when this happens, then this happens. And so uh, our rationale always is, a, is considering what is the cause, and if I do this cause, what effect will it produce, and so on. So, in Vedanta, from timeless, from time immemorial, ancient Vedanta, and in more recent times, in ancient Greece, Ar Aristotle, quite modern, relative to Vedanta. Uh, so the ancient Greeks, such as Aristotle, and, um, and also the Christians, medieval Christians, 
Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, they all had exactly the same analysis of causation. So, causation is divided into four parts. If you want to explain something or understand something, then you have to account for these four types of cause. So the first is the ingredient cause. For example, if there's a house, then the house is made of stone, wood, glass, hmm? the pipes may be made of copper, whatever. It's made of different ingredients. So the, the substances from which it's made, that's called the ingredient cause. In Vedanta, that's known as upadan karan. Upadan karan, the ingredient cause. Hmm? So, then you have the instrumental cause. What was the instrument that brought about the uh, building of the house? And that was the builder, the builder himself, the contractor. Uh, it could also include um, his hammer and his saw and whatever tools, his drill. All these things together, they're various aspects of the instrumental cause that brought about the um, the construction of the house. Uh, the instrumental cause in Vedanta is called Nimittakaran. Nimittakaran. And in, in Western philosophy it's called instrumental cause or operative cause. Yeah. Then you have the formal cause. You see? Because if you've got a pile of building materials and a builder, then actually unless the builder has a design from an architect, then what will he make? Hmm? If he's not an uh, expert in architecture, he d if he doesn't know about stresses and, 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 and weight and all of these things, he could make a house that collapses. Hmm? And so, so always, there has to be a design first. So the formal cause is, what is it that makes the house the way it is? It could be one story, it could be a bungalow, it could be two stories, three stories, detached house, semi-detached house, whatever. There are so many possibilities. But there's always, to explain something, you'll have to explain why it has the form that it has. And then there's the final cause. The final cause means, um, that's also called in Western philosophy, it's called uh, the tele teleology. Teleology. And in Sanskrit it's called artha. Artha. For example, in, in human life, the, the purpose of human life, there are four purposes. Dharma, Artha, Karma, Moksha. They're called the four Purusha Arthas, the four goals or final purposes of life. But each one leads to the next. And then the Param Purusha Artha, the fifth, which is really the ultimate and final course, is praying to develop love of God. Yeah? So everything has an Artha, just like a match. It has a certain goal directedness about it, a teleology that if you strike it, it produces fire. And uh, uh, the ingredients and the instrument that brought it about and its form is exactly all pointing towards that final goal of tsh, producing fire. Mm -hmm. Like your heart. Your heart has pipes coming in, pipes coming in, it has muscles because it has a teleology, it has a final cause and then it's that it should, boom, boom, boom. It should pump blood all over your body. It has that goal directedness and that's its purpose. But then the heart itself exists within a broader purpose that it's pumping your blood so that you can move. And you can move so you can get some food and stay alive and so on. So there's a hierarchy of causes, of goal directedness, of teleologies. And you find that everywhere. So coming back to our simple example of the house, the house was built so that the wealthy person who paid the architect and the contractor constructor can live there and enjoy his life with his family. So that was the... The ultimate cause of the, of, of the house like that. So, if we want to explain anything, we haven't really explained it until we have explained these four types of cause. So that's the basis in, in um, Christian theology, in ancient Greek philosophy, and in Vedanta. Um, of course, Vedanta begins with Atato Brahmajigyasa. Now, the desire to inquire about the Supreme Truth, Brahma, the greatest thing, the ground of being, the ultimate reality. And then the very next sutra is Janmadhyasya Yataha, that Supreme Reality is the cause of everything, from which the, the, the birth or the appearance of the forms of the world, etc., have come. 
So that first, that second sutra of the Danta is explained in the very first line of Srimad Bhagavatam. Janmadhyasya yatam vayaditarataschya teishva vigyaswarat. So here, Janmadhyasya, the supreme truth, is the cause of Janma, that means the birth, the actual forms of the world. The word Anvai in Sanskrit, the Acharyas explain, the word Anvai means directly the ingredient cause. God is the ingredient cause of the world. And then Itara means the instrumental cause. So Janmadhyasya Syaya mm-hmm. Yatanvaya Itara Cha Arteshu and the Artas, the final causes, the goal directedness of everything. Abhigya, Supreme Lord, is fully conscious of those and he's Swarat. In other words, though he's moving everything, he's independent. He's the unmoved mover, as they would say in Western philosophy. So the very first line of Srimad Bhagavatam, which is the explanation of Veda- the second sutra of Vedanta, is precisely addressing the analysis of reality in terms of these four types of causation. Of course, Brahma Samhita says, Sarva Karna Karanam, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He's all of those, the cause of all causes. He's actually all of them. And that's the speciality of Vedanta. There are six classical systems of philosophy in Vedic culture. And, uh, and there are three main, also, non-Vedic philosophies, which are discussed in Vedanta. And, and they all have their, um, their attributes and their defects as well. But Vedanta has one speciality that the Supreme Reality, the Personality of God is, is identified as each and every one of these causes. Whereas the other philosoph- philosophers say, well, he's this one but not that one, or he's that one and not this one. So if, if you study comparative philosophy, Indian philosophy, Nyai, Vaisheshik, Sankhya Darshan, Yoga Darshan, Purva Mimangsa, and, and Uttar Mimangsa, then this, these topics come up. That's a subject for another day. Um, but I'm just trying to impress upon you the importance of the subject of causation in Vedanta and not only Vedanta, throughout the entire history of philosophical and religious reasoning. Mm-hmm. Now, when we talk about ingredient cause, instrumental cause, formal cause, final cause, that's not the end of it because we also have, we have effects and we have their I- immediate causes, intermediate causes, remote causes and ultimate causes. So because causes are always in series, they're in the chain. Chains of cause and effect. And those chains are relevant to each one of these categories of causation as well. So let's take, let's take the ingredient cause. So what is it? let's say you're making a cake and so there's an ingredient, there's, a, there's flour in this cake. But you're calling it flour because that's what it looks like to you. But if you zoom in in a microscope, then what is it? Then someone might say, well, it's some molecules or something. And if you go further in with an electron microscope, then, well, it's atoms. And you go further and then it's it's electrons and muons and gluons and quarks and, and everything. And there's a whole particle zoo and no one actually came to the end of it. That's astonishing. No one came to the end. Do you know what that means? That means that no one knows what anything is, <laughs> actually. We'll, a little later we'll discuss about the, the limitations and the problems with empirical science in, as an approach to understanding the truth. We'll return to that later. But I'm just giving some examples that uh, these causal series uh, are there in all of these categories. It's very important to understand. And, and a lot of philosophy is focused on um, discussion of these causal series and seeing how far we can go in our thinking. Mm-hmm. Now, causal series are of, of uh, two types. We can call them horizontal causal series or sometimes philosophers call them uh, the horizontal causal series are um, th- that means events in time. And so they're called in philosophy accidental causal series. Accidental causal series. And, and, and the, the essence of an accidental causal series is that even though one event is the cause of another event, or one thing is the cause of something else, the previous thing can then be 
uh, disintegrated. It, 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 can, who, it can be a person who dies or it can pass away. And the, the effects still remain, even though the causes are no longer present. For example, you are the son of your father, who is the son of your grandfather, who is the son of your great-grandfather. So probably your great-grandfather and perhaps your grandfather has already passed away, but you are still here. So in an accidental series or a horizontal causal series, that's a series of events in time and the effects don't depend on the existence of their previous cause. Of course, the previous cause had to exist, but they don't have to exist right now uh, for the effects to exist. So that's called a horizontal uh, series. You know, if you're making a graph, it would be the x-axis. The x-axis, time. Time along the x-axis. But then, there's also something called the vertical causal series. So the vertical cause of seri uh, causal series is... Uh, and in philosophy that's called essential series, or in SC, in, in Latin, in SC, the uh, essential causal series. That means if, if the cause disappears, the effect disappears. Hmm? For example, if you're sitting in the fifth story of a building, and someone blows up the first story of the building, right? you're not going to just be suspended there in space. You'll no longer be the fifth story, the whole thing will <laughs> crash down. right? So, and, and in other words, the, 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 the um, existence of the fifth story right now, vertically in time, depends on the existence of all the other stories. Or for example, let's say music. You're listening to some music. And if the person stops playing, there's no music. It's a vertical causal series and it's happening, the causes are basically stacked on top of each other in layers right now. Hmm? And if the bottom layer isn't there, then everything may disappear or it will be changed in some way. So when we were just speaking earlier about the ingredient cause, it means that behind what we are thinking uh, are the molecules and atoms and electrons and everything, it's got to go down, 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 down. And there's got to be something at the bottom of it. Hmm. Yeah. And if that's something at the bottom, which we're calling the ground of being, or in Vedanta called Brahman, the truth, if that foundation of reality, Krishna said, Brahman, oh, he put his time, I am the basis of Brahman, even. If that ground of being, that original cause, hmm, is not there, everything disappears. In other words, the whole universe is like the music, and God is the, is the musician. If, he, if his will were not involved in everything at every moment, then nothing would exist right now. Because many people think, when they think about creation, they think, well, in the beginning of time, God created the universe. And many people have an idea that the universe is like clockwork. God wound it up and put it there, and He's gone away. <laughs> and it's the machine's just going on, and God's not really involved in anything anymore. Right? But th because the Supreme Truth is always also the ingredient cause, everything is dependent on that ground of being at every moment, actually. So some people have the idea that, well, perhaps the universe is eternal. So Buddhists, actually, this is one of the arguments of Buddhism, that the, that the universe is eternal and therefore there's no need for a God. Mm. Mm? Recently I was discussing with one academic and, uh, and he was saying that um, it may be by the study of physics we may come to the conclusion that the universe is eternal, therefore it's a-causal. Mm. And so we don't have to think about a God. Mm? Is, that, is that logical? Does that make sense? It makes absolutely no sense because he's only thinking about horizontal causal series. He's not thinking about vertical causal series. Mm -hmm. Because even if the universe were eternal, and in the, in the Vedic culture we do believe that the material energy manifests and unmanifests the universe again and again eternally with no beginning. But still it doesn't dispense for the necessity of an ultimate cause uh, because you will need a... Uh, vertical, call, uh, an end to the vertical causal series, you see? And this person is, uh, I was, this guy has a PhD and is a high level, um, actually, computer a programmer, an artificial, artificial intelligence guy. So, um, just giving some example about, to just try to stretch our minds a little bit. You know, when you do yoga and you stretch, right? So we're doing a little consciousness stretching. <laughs> and, and that's really what Vedanta, that's why Vedanta is, 
is not merely a metaphysics, it's not a discussion about something out there. The discussion itself is a metapsychology. Because the discussion of causation reveals how expanded your consciousness is. So now we, we, we've been discussing context, causation, and the third ingredient is consciousness. Now, this is very, very important. According to Vedanta, and I'm just going to say this now, and you should just accept it for now. And like when you learn chemistry at school, you've never seen an atom. You've never seen a molecule, but the teacher gets some balls on sticks like this and says, this is carbon molecule, and you will write it down. You don't ask him, well, how do you know it's a carbon molecule? Have you ever seen a carbon molecule? <laughs> you can't just jump in like that and doubt and be skeptical about everything. If you want to learn a subject, first you have to accept some of the hypothesis, at least theoretically, like that, and then see if it works, and then you can do an experiment and find out if it's true. So I'm promising you that everything that I'm going to say right now is 100% true, and you can prove it for yourself. So what I want to say is that our, we have a gross physical body, and we have a subtle psychological body. Uh, uh, but we ourselves, we are conscious beings, and that is Atma the soul. We're spiritual in nature. And the consciousness of the soul is now limited by, it has an upadi, a designation. So our consciousness is being limited by the mind. So the, the, the mind has different, the psych, subtle psychological body has different components. And so the first level is called chitta. And that is, we could call that the pre-egoistic mind. The mind in which the ego has not yet developed. And then when that that uh, pre-egoistic mind condenses, it becomes that substance, becomes more condensed, it becomes ego. And then from that comes the post-egoistic mind. So as long as you have an ego, as long as you're identifying thinking this body is you, your pre-egoistic mind has not been exposed yet. And so you're only experiencing your post-egoistic mind. So you're always thinking, oh, my name is Bill, or, oh, sorry, actually, his name is Bill. Right? <laughs> but just, don't take it personally, it's just an example. My name is Bill, or my, ma my name is Janet, or whatever it is, and, and, and I am this body, and I'm from this country, and I live here, and I've got all these problems that I'm dealing with. Right? <laughs> so all those thoughts in your mind, they're all coming from the post-egoistic mind. Hmm? Now, enlightenment, or the realization of God, doesn't happen in the post-egoistic mind. Self-realization, God realization, happening in the pre-egoistic mind, the chitta. Chaito Dharpana Marjanam. You have to clean all those lower things out and get a, a clean chitta. Hmm? So, now, what happens is that the, the subtle psychological body becomes more condensed or more contracted. Hmm? As it becomes more condensed and more contracted, the less you have the ability to think in terms of causation. And the more you, your consciousness expands, the more you can think in terms of causation. Hmm? So we can, an illustration I like to give is very practical. If you, have a, if you have a cat and you throw a pebble towards a cat, the cat will watch the pebble bounce like this and spin around and then wait and wait for the pebble to, what will the, be the pebble's next move? So, uh, the, the cat, if you throw something, the cat will follow it. But if you throw a pebble towards a dog, the dog won't even, it will just look up and say, who threw that? You see? Because the cat is seeing something right in front and making a causal closure there. This thing that I'm seeing, that's where the causation is. That's where the seat of causation is. Uh, if, uh, when I was a little boy, I used to sometimes make a little paper mouse and put it on the end of a string. And then you put it in front of a cat, and then you pull it, and the cat jump, and you pull it, and so the cat misses it, and they jump again and again. And you can just fool them like this the whole day. They never figure out that the, ma the mouse is not actually a mouse, and he's not moving himself. You're just pulling a string. But you try that with a dog. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. You put a little something on the end of a string and pull it, and the dog will just look at you and think, I used to bit. <laughs> and the reason is because as the consciousness expands, the ability to see the cause, the locus, the center of causation moves further and further away from the superficial appearance of things. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you can measure 
the essentially the uh, the <coughs> diameter of your consciousness, uh, or your the, you can measure the diameter of your conceptual horizon relative to where you stop, where you make the causal closure, where you place the locus of final causation. That's the point where your mind, your thinking ends. And beyond that is oblivion. There's nothing outside of that for you. When we're, we're thinking, each and every person is constructing the meaning of life. And so you have the inner circle there, is your perceptual horizon. And then the meaning that your life has is a, is a product of the relationship between what you're seeing and your conceptual horizon. Right? Now, the conceptual horizon stops where you stop thinking about causation. We, we have a um, causal closure. Where you make a close on the subject of cause, that is your conceptual horizon. That's where your thinking stops. So, I have to say that the point where you make causal closure is subconscious. You don't think about it. It's in the periphery of your mind. It may be in your conscious mind, or it may be further in your subconscious mind. But there's a point where you no longer think about causes. And you're just dealing with things right in front of you. And, um, and so that causal closure, that is your conceptual horizon. It is the periphery of your consciousness. It marks the border, the outer edges of your uh, awareness. And the degree to which that is expanded, that's the degree to which your consciousness is expanding. The degree to which it's, it's narrow, that's the degree to which you're narrow-minded. Uh, you see? So, this is a very important concept to understand. Causal closure, in other words, the metaphysical discussion of causation itself is a discussion to enhance and expand our consciousness. Because the more, uh, the more the chitta is contracted, then the, the earlier you make the causal closure, and the more the chitta is expanded, the later you make the causal closure. Now, the chitta expands and contracts in the element of ether, uh, in, 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 in Vedic cosmology. So the ether is called akash, and another word for akash in Sanskrit is, is ka, ka. So Krishna says, Shabda ke parasham nishu. I am the sound in the ether. K means in the ka. It's a locative case. Ka. So when your consciousness is expanded, you feel really happy. Because that's sattva gun. Sattva gun is an expanded consciousness. And, tam and rajagun is a contracted consciousness. And tamagun is a very contracted consciousness. You see? So when the, your consciousness is expanded in the ka, then it's very beautiful. So that state is called sukha. The word for happiness in Sanskrit is sukha, means beautiful ether. In other words, your consciousness is nicely expanded in ether, so happiness in Sanskrit is called sukha. Hmm? And what is misery called? Dukha. 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 Hmm? Kind of dirty, horrible space. Hmm? Yeah, because your consciousness is contracted. And that's essentially it's really important because everyone's searching for happiness, but no one really knows what it is. is it, what is happiness? So in Sanskrit, the exact words, sukha and dukkha, tell you what happiness is. Happiness is when your consciousness is expanded, you feel great, and when it's contracted, you feel angry and upset and, 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 and envious and all of these things. They're all the negative emotions, they're just a contraction of consciousness, you see? So it's very important, if, so, if we're speaking on a personal level, or even on a civilizational level, how would you decide how to make a law, or what's good for people, or what's not good for people? To masic and rajasic things, even though the person says, well, I really like this, it gives me happiness. But no, it makes a momentary expansion of the consciousness, when you experience that sense gratification, but because the activity itself is rajasic, it causes a rapid contraction of consciousness afterwards, and then you feel miserable, and you're dependent on that. You think, I have to get that again, to expand my consciousness again. And so then it becomes a cycle of addiction. You see? Whereas persons who follow Dharma, religious life, by praying, by absorbing their mind in the cause of all causes, 
which is behind everything, their consciousness is slowly expanding and without any kind of stimulation at all, they gradually feel more and more blissful. Right? You see? So, um, I, I can't cover all the implications of what we're discussing tonight, but I'm just trying to throw some things out there so you can see that what we're discussing has a massive, massive implications on every aspect of life, whether it's social life, political life, legal life, your personal life, your inter interactions with people, your habits, and everything on every level. That's why it's meta-psychology. It's meta it covers everything. So that's clear that your consciousness, the expansion and contraction of your consciousness is proportional to your happiness and distress. And it's also proportional to the way that you think about causation. Because the more contracted the consciousness, the earlier you make the causal closure. Oh, let's experiment a little bit. Let's measure someone's mind. <laughs> Who shall we measure? How about <laughs> no, no, I just, just for everyone, you can think, think about this. Let's say you're standing at a train station on the platform, right? And there's all these box carriages are going by, these carriages are all going by, and it's a long train, you can't see the back of it, and you can't see the front of it, right? You, it happens, sometimes in India, it happens all the time, you come to those <laughs> level crossings and the train comes and you're waiting for so long. So you can't see the front and the back and all the carriages are moving. Okay, so let's say you're there for a really long time, like years and years and years, <laughs> and you wonder, you wonder, well, what's what's moving this? Is is something moving this? You can apply this to the world. It, the whole universe is moving, right? But everything that's moving is being moved by something else, which is being moved by something else. Is there an engine at the front of all this movement or not? Now when you speak about box carriages, then you know that there must be an engine at the front pulling everything. But you see everything in the world is moving, and whatever's moving is moved by something else. Is there some, en is there some last thing that's moving everything? So in philosophy that's called the prime mover. Uh, and that's equated with God in ancient Greek philosophy, Aristotle or in medieval times, Thomas Aquinas and so on. That's God. And so in the Vedas as well, Janmadhya Syayata, the cause of everything. That which is moving everything. So in that sense, there must be a God. But let's say if you're like a Buddhist or some type of materialist or empiricist, and you just say, well, no, the, 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 this train goes on forever. There's no end of it that way or that way. So have we dispensed with the necessity of, of, of a mover? Even if it's infinite in both directions, uh, then there must be something moving, otherwise everything would be still. Still, even if it, if it were infinite as well. So you can think about causation in this way. Let's say it were infinite in all directions. Hmm? Then you still haven't explained how it's moving. Why? Because all the carriages are joined to each other. So what made the, what it's called in Sanskrit the Sangat, the aggregate? You have to explain the aggregate. Because if all these box carriers weren't joined to each other, then they wouldn't be the immediate instrumental causes of each one moving as well. And then you haven't explained the ingredient cause. Because if the, the carriages weren't made of something, and at the end of that vertical causation there wasn't something, then they wouldn't even exist. You see? So, the causation is not only instrumental causation, but you have the formal causation, the sangha, the aggregate of the system, and you have the um, vertical causation, and uh, what's the ultimate purpose as well? Uh, the, this, that's not even addressed. Mm -hmm. So we can think about causation in this way, and that applies to everything around us. Uh, but generally what we do, if something, a problem comes in our life, we say, you're the cause, you did this. Uh -huh. eh? We're always pointing and blaming things. It's my neighbor, it's my wife, it's the government, it's the weather, or what, whatever. It's global warming, whatever it is. And everyone is saying that this is the cause of my happiness and distress. But because everyone's making a closure somewhere. And that's why they're all miserable. Because when you make a closure, that's a contraction of consciousness. Hmm? Unless you close at the ultimate cause. And only
only a person in, who in every situation in their life makes the closure, the ultimate cause, is completely blissful. And their consciousness is fully expanded. And they never blame anyone or criticize anyone for anything. They become Trinada peace with each other. Amani Nama, giving respect to everyone. Because they're not closing anywhere. They are actually Krishna conscious. So, now, let's uh, move along to some other interesting implications of, of Vedanta. Where your conceptual horizon ends and you make that causal closure, then beyond that, there's nothing. You're, that you're incomplete. It's a, an oblivion. You're oblivious to what lies beyond that. You don't even think about it. It's an above. It's an absence. It's a, and it's a context blindness. In other words, just as you know, <coughs> the horizon continues after, <coughs> beyond where you can see. <coughs> but essentially, <coughs> what we're doing, conceptually, is just denying that anything lies outside of our own conceptual horizon. And we do it knowingly, or we do it unknowingly, we do it involuntarily, we do it subconsciously. We're ignoring what lies beyond our causal closure point. And so in Sanskrit, that's called avidya. Ignorance. <coughs> Ignorance. So don't think, don't entertain the idea for a moment that, that atheists are rational. They're not rational. They only appear to be rational because they're, con they're consistent between the components of their perception and their conceptions. So they're, they're logical within the field of their perceptions and conceptions, but their causal closure is fully irrational. So they have a totally irrational context. And so, if you discuss with any atheist about causation, someone who doesn't believe in God and a, and a personal God, and you, ju you can just take them by the hand and walk them through their idea of causation right to the edge of their causal closure and say, my dear friend, gaze upon the abyss. <laughs> Which is nothing but your own ignorance. Rationally you understand that causation continues, but you've chosen to just close it down right there. You see? So there's no such thing actually as a rational atheist. He can be logical. Because logical is, log, uh, lo logic is a syllogism that you apply to some given facts. Hmm? But there aren't any given facts. <laughs> Unless you uh, go explain the, cause, the, the causes of those facts, and then you can be logical about them. So they, have, they, they make a causal closure, they collect together um, opinions which are essentially irrational and use them as facts and then they're logical on top of that they put their logic system on top of it so it's they have the ego that they're logical but they're actually they're irrational because the thing about logic is it can process information but it cannot generate its own premises mm -hmm. Understand? logic reason cannot generate its own premises it can only process some given premises mm -hmm. so <clears throat> Now we're coming. Problems with empirical science. We have some scientists here tonight. Yes? What? Physics. Long Physics, great. Physics and electronics. Physics. Physics, electronics. Chemistry. Chemistry. Anyone? Computer science? Artificial intelligence? <laughs> okay, so we've got, great, we've got some scientists in the room. Problems with empirical science. Let's start with... The language of science is mathematics. Language of science is mathematics. Mathematics is really interesting because, let's take something, 2 plus 2 equals 4. It definitely equals 4. Not, that's not controversial. There's no one in the world who disagrees with that idea that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Right? Does anyone in the room disagree? Okay, we all agree. So that's amazing. And so mathematics is the paradigm of certain knowledge. Right? Mathematics. Because mathematics is the paradigm of absolutely certain knowledge, we consider that this is a great language for understanding the world because it can give us certain knowledge. Okay. Now, the problem with math is this. I have this question. If you, let's say you're a materialist and you think everything is material, then my question is this. Do numbers exist mm -hmm. 
And if they do, please tell me what's the chemical composition of a number. <laughs> hmm? Can you? You're a physicist, you deal with maths. Do numbers exist? No, they don't. Huh? They don't physically exist. They conceptually exist, but they don't physically exist. Right? So they don't physically exist. So if your mind, if your, if your brain is made of matter also, then your, your mind should not be able to conceive of them. Hmm? Right? You understand? So what we have, do, because it, there's, a, there's a philosophy called the philosophy of mathematics, and it goes like this. There are no numbers anywhere. Right? But let's say I've got three apples. Apple number one, apple number two, apple number three. So we have three apples here. Now, this apple is one, and this apple is one, and this is also one apple. So where, I, the only number I know is one. Where do these other numbers come from? So the other numbers come from the psychological process of identifying a universal. In Sanskrit, that's called jati or samanya. And in Western philosophy, it's called universals. That we psychologically perceive universals or something which is common between things and then we can put them together in a series. So when you see that, you have this idea of apple. And it's a universal ideal. When I say the word apple, you think of apple, but you don't think of a particular apple that you, ha you ate, you know, in, in 1978 on Wednesday afternoon at 4 o'clock. Right? You just have this idea, apple. It's just a concept. And so every apple you see is an example of apple. So if you count all the apples in the world, here's one apple, one apple, one apple. These, these are all examples of apple, but what's apple? If these are all examples of apple, what's apple? So the, we think in terms of universals. And so even though this is a distinct collection of atoms in a particular, occupying a particular space, so that's one, and this is another completely distinct collection of atoms occupying another space, but because we um, perceive a universal within these particulars, we can call this one, and if there's another one uh, in the same category of jati or samanya universal, we'll call this, the other one two. And then we'll call three, like that. So mathematics is actually a psychological process which depends on the perception of jati universals within particulars. <laughs> So just when you were thinking that mathematics is the most objective thing ever, you have to understand that it's completely dependent on psychological processes because numbers don't exist in the material world, actually. So now let's move on a little bit more about maths. What we find with maths is you can make equations, right? And so by these equations we can make predictions. Force equals mass times acceleration, right? Okay, so if you increase the mass, then the force will be more. Yes. If you decrease the acceleration, the force will be less and so on. So what you have is that the, the formulas of science, they deal with the correlation between measurable variables. Mm -hmm. Right? That's, that's what mathematical formulas do, scientific formulas. They explain or they describe the correlations between measurable variables and on the basis of that you can make predictions. So it's, it's operational. If I do this, it will do this. If I do this, it will do that. Now the interesting thing about any mathematical formula is that a mathematical formula is always the same. Hmm? 2 plus 2 equals 4. Put it on the wall, put it on the floor, take it to Japan, take it to the moon. 2 plus 2 equals 4. In other words, mathematics as a language is not context sensitive. So context, which is the all-important component of meaning, is not present in math. Right? It's clear. Okay. Second thing. Causation is completely absent in math. You can say that, well, because I changed the mass, so the force was more. <laughs> right? But actually, that's just a correlation. You can't say why that is. For example, there's a gravitational constant. But no one can do an experiment to prove why the gravitational constant is what it is. We just know that that's what it is. And it's fixed. And, and so all the proportions change. Uh, the correlations change in a fixed way. But we don't know why they change in a fixed way. You see? It doesn't deal with causation. Mathematics, physics, science, it's an operational discord. It's the difference between 
just any low IQ person learning how to use an iPhone and then asking him, can you make an iPhone? Right? Any dumb person can use a smartphone. Right? But they don't know how to make one. Right? So they know if I press this button, this happens. If I press this button, this happens. So science is like mathematical description of reality is like that. If I move this, then this happens. If I move that, then this happens. So it's actually predictive abstraction. Scientific formulas are predictive abstraction. They don't address the sub subject of context and they don't address the subject of causation. Hmm? At all. And the last one is consciousness. They don't deal with subjectivity at all. Mass does not deal with subjectivity, but itself doesn't exist in the physical world. It's a product of subjectivity. Hmm? A mirror cannot see itself, a knife cannot cut itself. They may be useful, but they cannot know themselves. You see? So now what happens is, the scientists use this methodology to understand the world called math. Math is a language of science and then they use this to understand the world and they investigate everything and after investigating everything they come to the conclusion that hmm, there's no meaning to life, there's no God and there's no consciousness. Consciousness is an illusion. It's called, that's, that's called illimitive materialism. That you just have all these neurons firing in your brain and somehow or other it gets to a particular state of complexity and a light comes on and, and the brain becomes aware of itself. But it's not really. Because matter, each individual atom has no personality. It's not an individual. The, the, the idea that we are individual, one, unitary, conscious or transcendent being is just an illusion coming about by the mind. And that's one of the big defects of modern psychology because modern psychology is based on the, uh, the uh, foundation of the structures of neurology. And they're always trying to discover just neural correlates. Neural correlates, because they can't deal with causes. Neural correlates. You see? So, we have this situation where the scientists or atheists are telling us, um, of course many scientists are theists and they're fine. But some atheists, they try to appropriate the charisma of science and tell us that science tells us that there's no God, that there's no ultimate cause, that there's no such thing as spirit or consciousness, there's no meaning, and so on. And then people try to look at the math and figure it out, well, how is that? You don't have to do that. The reason that science didn't discover meaning, the reason it didn't discover consciousness, the reason it didn't discover the ultimate cause is because all these ingredients were removed from the very beginning by adopting the language of mathematics. You understand? Everyone's looking at the, the results of the experiment and trying to look at all the data and why can't we find God, why can't we find meaning, why can't we find consciousness? Well, I could have predicted that you're not going to find any of those things because the methodology that you adopted from the beginning, the paradigm of mathematics as being a, a method of knowledge, already discounted causation, uh, context and consciousness from the beginning. Hmm? So it's not a big surprise to us, who know Vedanta, that you didn't discover any of these things. Also what it means, and, and this is very important, that mathematics already removes context causation and consciousness. Obviously, maths removes context. Let's have a look, just for a moment, at how mathematical approach to life, or the mathematicized conception of matter, um, uh, fails to explain causation. You see? So, when people describe matter in mathematical sense, then it has uh, location, it has velocity, it has dimension, length, distance, all of these things are the characteristics, mathematical characteristics of matter. But is matter limited to those characteristics? It's an incomplete, it's a selective explanation of matter. But what we have is, essentially, all matter and energy is the same, it's interchangeable. Right? E equals mc squared, it's all the same, the energy and matter is the same everywhere. And the laws of nature which are acting on that matter are the same everywhere. So if matter, if the, the substance of reality is universal, it's the same everywhere, and the laws of nature are also universal, we don't expect that, um, you know, in this room, the uh, acceleration due to gravity will be whatever, 
and if you go in the other room, it will be 7.3. Right? It's universal. So this, the substance is universal, and the laws acting on it are universal. Now you have no explanation whatsoever for the variety of forms in the world. The formal cause. Right? You've lost it. You've lost the thought formal cause somewhere. All the scientists say that the, that the matter and or the energy is universal and the laws are universal. Now they have no way of explaining whatsoever why there's a variety of forms anyway. So their own paradigm is completely contradictory and doesn't explain anything about the world around us. Huh? That maybe you'll have to watch the video again and digest because there's many points coming one after another. But just to recap what we're discussing, science deals with the correlation between measurable variables here. Context causation and consciousness are not addressed at all. They've been removed in the beginning, so you're not going to find them at the end. Um, science is an operative discourse. It tells you, if you press this button, this will happen. It's not an ontological discourse. And so if anyone tells you that science proves that there is no God, then they're not being rational. Because the discussion of God is an ontological conclusion. And you cannot come to ontological conclusion on the basis of operational premises. See, to be logical, you need premises and you can come to conclusion. But if your premises are all operational, they're not ontological, you cannot process them and come to an ontological conclusion. So anyone who says, science, I don't believe in God because of science, they're completely irrational. Because they're taking the operational discourse as the premises and, and trying to draw an ontological conclusion from it. It's completely irrational. But they're blind to this because they made a causal closure and they're all confused, basically. Because the consciousness is contracted. Contracted consciousness. Materialism, atheism, impersonalism, they're all functions of contracted consciousness. So we have to know the method how to expand the consciousness. And that is chanting, focusing the heart and surrendering to the Holy Name, expands the consciousness. That is the therapy for recovering atheists. <laughs> you say, you don't believe God, no problem, just chant, you will. <laughs> okay, so that was just summarizing some of the points we've been discussing. And now we're moving on to here. Since the time of Galileo through to René Descartes and uh, John Locke, these are the, the, the persons who are the foundation of, of the modernity, actually, the modern way of looking at the world. So they made a distinction. And the ancient Greeks, they never did this. The medieval Christians never did it. In Vedanta, we don't do this. They made a distinction between primary uh, properties and, and secondary uh, qualities of things. So the, the primary pro property, if you have something in front of you, its primary properties are completely objective. Its height its width, its depth, its weight, its, or its motion, and so on. So these are facts, and they're, they're objective, doesn't rely on any subjective judgment. It's the same for me and for you. So those are the primary qualities of the object. And then the secondary qualities are what's known in, in philosophy as qualia, and in Sanskrit it's called tanmatra. tanmatra. So um, that means the qualities of the object that produce sensations. So if you look at it and it's blue, so you experience the blueness of it, or the fragrance of it, or you, you taste it and it's sweet or sour. So all the sensory experiences that we have of that object, they're considered to be secondary properties, and they're not actually, modern science consists they're not in the things themselves. That's just what we experience. That's subjective, it's not in the object. So the, the secondary qualities are the properties, um, you know, for example, you say uh, the, the, the strawberry is red, but then the scientists say, no, no, it's not really red. It's just that the, 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 the uh, chemicals in the strawberry are in such an excited state that it reflects a certain type wavelength of light, and when that wavelength goes in your eye, then you have this experience called red, but the strawberry is not actually, all objects of the world are actually odorless, colorless, tasteless, fragranceless. Everything, but we just experience them like that because we have that's how our, our instruments function, you see. So the primary qualities are in the objects, the secondary qualities are not really there, that's just our subjective experience. Mm -hmm. So that's modernity is based 
on this idea. Now, the, you know what the problem with this is, even though practically 99.9% .9 of all the people in the world think in this way? You know what the problem of that is? The problem is this, that that matter from which that object is made, which has no, there's no qualia in it. Qualia is sense perceptions, sense objects as they're experienced by us. The blueness of blue, the, the, the loudness of a sound, the sweetness of, of, a, of a fragrance or a taste. Uh, so those are not actually in the objects, they're not in the matter. Now the problem with that idea is this, that they say, well, they're just in your brain, but your brain's made of matter. So if you deny them there, you can't have them here. So it's basically what they're doing, the materialists are doing, because they can't answer the question of qualia or conscious experience. They just say, oh, it's not in matter, and they sweep it under the rug. They're just sweeping it under the rug. It's, it's in the brain somewhere, and they sweep it there. But then you say, but the brain's made of matter. You can't sweep it under the rug. Can we just move that rug? Look, it's still there. We still have these things called qualia, or experiences of color, sound, and, and everything. And so... These are some of the, the, the big problems with science. But people have faith in it. Why? Because it, 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 it's a predictive abstraction. You can use it to predict things, so people think it must be true because this thing was predicted. But it has many, many problems. And all of these problems are answered by Vedanta. Completely. Now let's look a little bit about how Vedanta answers these problems. According to Vedanta, there is a ground of being, Brahman. Brahma sabde kohi purna swayam Bhagavan. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said that the word Brahman actually means Bhagavan Krishna. Mm. Krishna. So the ground of being, the cause of everything, is Supreme Personality of Godhead. And he has his separate parts, the souls, the Atma, the Self. And they are, those two categories are transcendental, spiritual. And then you have the material energy. So the material energy begins with the first element. The first element in the universe is called the Mahatattva. And when that element is in your subtle body, because every element in the universe is in your body, your body is like a microcosm of the universe. So you can know all about the universe by understanding your own uh, physio uh, 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 physiology. So the Mahatattva is the first manifestation of a material element, and that's present in your subtle body as Chitta, or pre-egoistic mind. And when that condenses by the mode of ignorance, it becomes ego, and then you have the po then that condenses again, becomes the post-egoistic mind, and the intelligence, and then the senses. The senses are actually um, uh, atoms, and they surround the atma in the heart chakra. There are, each one, is, is a, there are five atoms there surrounding the atma in, in the heart chakra. And then you have qualia. So according to the Vedic cosmology, the sense objects, they're called uh, in Sanskrit tanmatra. The tanmatras of sound, touch, taste, form, smell, shabdasparsha, rupa, rasaganda. These five things, they are, they are primary. It's not that things have, something has color or something <coughs> smells. These tanmatras are primary. And it's the combination of the tan matras that makes our experience of gross elements. You see? So when we, we see something, there's something there, it's, it's solid, we can't walk through it. But we see it has color, it has fragrance, it has taste. It's actually, those tan matras are primary. They're the cause of the experience of gross matter. So it's not that experiences of color and sound are in you. They're actually in the objects according to Vedic cosmology. And that's why you experience them. So it's, um, uh, our experience of those objects would be philosophically called direct representationalism. There's a representation of the object in our mind, but it does actually correspond with what's out there. Uh, so that's called direct representationalism. And uh, so you have the Supreme Lord, you have God, the ground of being, the cause of all causes, then the souls, those are the spiritual categories, and then from then all these things, that's the causal chain. God is the cause of everything, but in the material world, each element is caused by the previous elements. From the pre-egoistic mind element, chitta, all the way down to um, space, air, water, sorry, space, air, fire, water, and earth, the gross elements. 
So that's how the um, the that's the cosmology according to the Vedas. The material elements they're separated from the spiritual elements there. So now I want to move on to discussing how the practice of bhakti that is the consciousness, the awareness of our context that we exist within the Supreme Reality and we can never be separated from the Supreme Personality of God at any moment. So living a life of devotion and chanting and remembering Krishna uh, brings about the expansion of consciousness and why everything that we've been discussing today is actually true science because it's only a science if you can prove your hypothesis right so what we have is everyone is experiencing the world their perceptions of this world and this world is an effect of an intermediate cause which is an effect of a remote cause which is an effect of the ultimate cause Krishna now the ordinary person has his perceptions and he makes sense of it by the context of his conceptions and that conceptions have a horizon and beyond that he has context blindness now if the remote cause or the, or the ultimate cause are in that category of where you have context blindness then you're an atheist mm -hmm. or you're a person who due to social conditioning believes in God but you have no experience of God you've been told that there's a God and it makes it and you believe in it but it's still outside of your conception and it's outside of your perception for sure hmm? so what happens is when we uh, discuss the theory of Vedanta Bhakti Vedanta then what happens our conceptual horizon expands to include the levels of causation in other words the gross elements the tan matras, the intelligence, the senses, the mind, the ego and beyond the ego and the soul and ultimately the supreme soul. So we can accommodate within our conceptual horizon all of these things, theoretically. And when we do that, when we hear from the guru, from the spiritual master, and now our life has a new meaning because our conceptual horizon has expanded and that's given new meaning to the things that we can see. And now we live our life treading the devotional path. Okay? So, what happens? Here we are. Little animation. Disney, eat your art out. Here we go. You see? By listening, by, by listening to the spiritual master, you gradually learn about the different layers of existence. The immediate cause, the remote cause. And you learn also about the... Krishna. Now that has come within your conceptual horizon and your life has a different meaning and so now you live in a completely different way. Now what happens when you begin to live, in a, uh, live your life in a different way, then your consciousness starts to expand. And as it expands, as your consciousness expands, your perceptual horizon begins to expand as well. And you begin to experience the different layers of existence. You begin to understand the functions of your subtle body and so on. And you, ultimately your soul. And ultimately what happens is this. That your perceptual horizon expands and you see Krishna. Right? That, is, that, that is called in the stage of... Actually, it will start, you will begin to perceive Krishna from the stage of Nishta, actually. Mm -hmm. And it will become more clear in Ruchi, Asakti and Bhav. In Bhav, you actually enter into his eternal Leela. And this is why Krishna consciousness is a science. And why empirical science is just an, it's, I'm not going to say it's wrong. It's a very um, uh, valid operational discourse of um, predictive abstraction. That's exactly what it is. That's exactly what saying it. It's a valid method of predictive abstraction for operational discourse. But the subjective ontology of God is completely outside of that. So you can't borrow from that to know something about God. Whereas the meta-psychology of Vedanta is a complete science. It's not selective. It doesn't say we're going to measure things in such a way, but we're not going to address causation, context and consciousness. 
It includes all the parts of the picture. So it's a meta-psychology. Hmm? And it's a true science because if you follow the um, implications of the hypothesis, it will be demonstrated that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. You can see him and realize all of these things. So, um, I've covered a lot of ground this evening. I hope it was interesting. Sometimes we have to look at philosophy. If you hear a lot of pastimes and things like that, but you're not grounded in philosophy, you won't take it in the right way, and you will not taste it fully. So this is the foundation, our foundational knowledge. And when the foundation is strong, the mind becomes steady, and one can have a better, a higher experience of the, the more aesthetic elements of Vedanta, Bhakti Vedanta. Um, but I, I'm not going to go into this, this in detail. Perhaps next year when I come, I can cover this next thing. But I just want to give you a taster of another aspect, the next, which is more the details of what we've already discussed. Here we go. The, the more the mind is expanded, the more stable it becomes. The more it's contracted, the more oscillating and modulating it becomes. And when it becomes very contracted, the modulations actually interfere with each other and the mind kind of becomes inert. So that's essentially sattva, the peaceful state of mind, rajas, the busy oscillating state of mind, and then the contracted state where the oscillations are so contracted that they can't move and the mind becomes inert, the mode of ignorance. You know when you've had a late night and you wake up early and, uh, uh, and the mind is just inert. So there's, the mind has a spectrum of stability and this is discussed in, in, in great detail in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali and it's touched on also in the 11th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. But Patanjali, because this is really his area, he's expounded on it a little bit in more, a little more detail. So, the, the spectrum of stability is at the bottom, tamagun, inertia, which is called mudha. Mm -hmm. And then the next state is called kshipta, distraction, where rajas comes in, the mode of passion. And the mind can't concentrate, it's just flitting everywhere. Mm -hmm. And then the next state is called vikshipta, that means you concentrate, but you, uh, you're occasionally distracted. So you can concentrate, but not for long periods. And that's called, uh, so that's called Vikshipta. So we have in Sanskrit, Mudha, Kshipta, and Vikshipta. And those three stages are the stages that everyone generally experiences, the, the ordinary person experiences. In fact, many people these days, they can't come to the stage of a Vikshipta almost focus. They can't concentrate. They just, they flip between being in mental inertia and then having some coffee and the mind jumping around all over the place and going online with 10 pages all open at the same time and, you know, and answering the phone and cooking something and, and taking the dog for a walk all at the same time, right? So, most people, they're just going in between uh, the, the, the uh, tamas and rajas and then almost focus is very sattvic but with a little rajas. And some rajas is there. So some persons, perhaps intellectuals and so on, they experience that phase, deep concentration and they can penetrate a subject more. Um, so, but none of those stages are included in the category of yoga. They're not called yoga. And the reason is, if someone is in these three stages, they can't have an experience, a, they can't make a samskar of stability that will accumulate in, and, and bring them into a state of trance. You see? So the next two stages, focused, that's called ekagrata. Eka, uh, ekagra in Sanskrit means one pointed. So that is technically um, sampragyata samadhi. And there are different stages within that sampragyata samadhi. And then the last one is a full equilibrium, yoga chitta vritti nirodha aha. And that is the asampragyata samadhi. Uh, so I'm not going to go into all the details, just give you an idea that our mind has a spectrum of stability and the evolution of life, the evolution of education for all beings is to move gradually through that spectrum of stability and come to the full state of equilibrium. As Krishna said in Bhagavad Gita, Samatvam Yoga Uchate, Yoga means equilibrium. In Bhagavad Gita, Samatvam Yoga Uchita. Yoga is the state of mental equilibrium. Hmm? And there's a reason for that. 
because depending on where you are in the spectrum of mental stability, your perceptual horizon will go that far. Hmm? And so we'll just illustrate that as a, as a final um, part of our discussion today. The general person who's in the states of Muddha and Shipta and Vikshipta, they're either mentally inert, distracted, or partially focused. They can only experience gross matter, the gross mm -hmm. physical elements around them. And that's why they're materialists, because that's all they can experience, and their consciousness is contracted to that state. Mm -hmm. Only when a person can come into the state of Ekagrata, that is Sampragyata Samadhi, then they can begin to experience the next level of perception. And that is the qualia, the tanmatras. The tanmatras, which are the, the, the uh, components that make the gross elements. So there are actually um, essentially four stages of Sampragyata Samadhi. Nirvitarka, Nirvicha, Sananda and Sasmita. And so what happens is, when a person is in the state, they come into the state of nirvichara sampragyata samadhi, very steady mind, they can meditate on gross matter and understand all about its emergent properties. In other words, not the matter itself, but when it's put together in that particular form, it will have certain emergent properties. So, for example, um, Ayurvedic medicine. In India, there's a science of the, how all the whole body works and everything. But this knowledge wasn't collected by cutting people open and seeing what's inside. When the yogis did the Ekagrata Sampragyata Samadhi on the um, Manipurak Chakra, on the stomach chakra, then they began to experience all the emergent properties of the body. And that's how the Vedic medical science came about. It wasn't an empirically acquired science. It was called Yoga Jat knowledge born from yogic meditation. It's yoga jya jnan. Hmm? So, in the first state of Sampragyata Samadhi, that is um, the Nirvitarka, one can know about the emergent properties of matter. And when you go deeper into the next stage of trance, that is called the um, Nirvichar, then you can understand qualia the tanmatras, the subtle components but from which the gross elements are composed. Now, Om Bhur Bhuvahaswaha, in between the earth and the heavens, there's a level where the Upadevitas live. We discussed it the other day. Their bodies are made of tanmatras. Their bodies are made of tanmatras. So if a person can meditate deeply enough to the stage where they can perceive tanmatras, they can see the citizen charas flying in there. Airplanes. So that's when, when saints see the angels, that's what they're... It's not imagination or whatever, they haven't gone mad. If someone is deeply in meditation, it will automatically happen as the mind becomes more and more stable and you go through the stages of some Pragyata Samadhi, you'll experience not only the tan mattress of the things around you, but the other things which are composed of those tan mattress as well, those subtle realms. Um, then, when you go to the next stage, Sananda, some Pragyata Samadhi, then, there we go, <laughs> your um, perceptual horizon expands to include how your senses function. In other words, now you experience your senses sensing things, but in that state you'll see the mechanics of how the atoms of the senses are interacting with the pran, and the pran is spreading through the nadis of the body, and then interacting with the outer world. And when you experience that, you become very blissful. So that's called sananda. But this ananda is not ladini shakti, it's sattvic ananda. It's a sattvic mode of goodness ananda. And obviously you become completely detached from sense gratification. Because you can see how all the senses are working. Huh? So, um, this, this first stage of understanding of the gross matter will come in nishta. The second stage of understanding the qualia will come in ruchi. The third stage will come in Asakti, and in the Bhakti process. Then the next stage of Sampragyata is the, called Sasmit. It means you can experience everything up to uh, and including the, all of the elements up to the pre-egoistic mind. So there we go. In other words, you can see your own, actually the ego dissolves and you can see your own chitta. 
And in that state, you can see yourself, also your soul reflected in the chitta, mm -hmm. also very nicely. And then when you go beyond that to technically the Asampragyata Samadhi, then there's the experience of the, f the full experience of the self and the full realization, enter into Krishna's pastimes. Actually, for those who are yogis, they go through these uh, levels of experience. But for the devotee, the devotee will begin to experience Krishna's form in this stage, in this stage of um, Savitarka, sorry, Nirvitarka Samadhi. If he has devotion, Krishna's from the Nam, the Rup will appear. Then when he goes into the next stage, in the stage of Ruchi, he'll experience Krishna's associates. And then when he comes to the, up to this stage, the devotee will experience his own spiritual form. Mm -hmm. And then in the final stage, his form will actually enter into the Lila. Mm -hmm. This is a complete science of God consciousness. Don't have any doubt in it. <laughs> Our Acharyas, and I dare say some of their followers, have also done a very strict sadhan for many, many years and gone through these stages. And that's why they wander around the world trying to help others expand their consciousness and discover the meaning of life mm. and develop devotion for the Supreme Personality of God in Sri Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna. <laughs>